So just to just to let you guys know who Natalie is, I, I met Natalie when I went up to the Starvation uh, Reservoir Classic, and um, as part of the classic, they donated a bunch of money to D DWR um, for some projects, and talked to her about possibly coming to speak speak with us and talk about the project that projects that she's working on. Um, but I'll go ahead and turn the time over to her, and she's going to kind of tell us some of the things that are going on with Starvation Reservoir. Natalie, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? We can hear you great. I'm going to put you on mute so you don't get feedback, okay? I'm going to put sounds me good. on mute. <laughs> that sounds better. <laughs> okay, well, thanks, everybody. Um, I guess if you have questions, maybe just save them till the end. Uh, there's quite a bit I'm going to go through here, so I appreciate the time to go through this. So oh, the first part of the presentation is going to be kind of firsthand knowledge of what we saw in the 2022 fall walleye index netting. And now this is mostly preliminary. I'm just beginning to work up the data. So more to come on this. This is simple, simple stuff, but hopefully it gives you an idea of what we see in that fall walleye index netting. And it's a very important survey to us as we move into our starvation reservoir management team meeting this winter. And then I've also got the results of the survey that you guys helped me with um, probably a month and a half or two back now. So I know a lot of you participated in that. So I'll go through some of those results as well. So we did the fall walleye index netting in October. Um, we actually had to push it back a week because water temperatures were too warm. Our protocol says we have to be at 59 degrees or less at surface to start. And we had a pretty warm fall, so we pushed it back. We started the week of October 24th and it ran through the 26th. We sampled a total of 443 fish of which 208 were walleye and we sampled nine different species. So I kind of want to just let you guys see what the species composition looks like. So 52% of the uh, sample size was walleye. Um, Next up was flannel mouth sucker. And I don't know that you guys know that there's a good population of those in the reservoir, but there is, and we see them every fall walleye index netting that we do. Uh, smallmouth bass, 11%, yellow perch, six, brown trout, two, rainbow trout, eight, kokanee, 4%. That's, a, that's up from previous samplings we've done. And black crappie, I think there was two. So it's, it is about 1%. Um, and then there was one common carp in the sample as well. So this is some preliminary length frequency data. So this is a length frequency histogram. And I'm sorry, the bottom's in millimeters. Um, but this is data from the 2020 FWIN netting and the 2022 FWIN netting. So 2020 is in orange and 2022 is in blue. And you can clearly see that we have a pretty big uh, abundance of walleye in the 12 to 14 inch range still. Um, we also have, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but we also have a better group of these 20 to 22 inch walleye right here. And then we had quite a few bigger walleye show up in the sample as well. So definitely look better than 2020 samples, um, but we do still have this pretty high abundance of these smaller walleye in the system. And we'll get into that here in a little bit. <clears throat> so this is a length frequency histogram from 2009 through 2020. And I just wanted to show you guys, and I know this is busy, I hate busy diagrams, but this has many years worth of length frequency histograms added into this um, diagram. So up in the upper left corner, you're starting at 2009. And frequency is on the left and total length is on the bottom. So you can kind of see how we get some spikes. Um, we get some leveling out in 2010, 2011, 2013 was just low numbers overall in the sample. And it was 2014 when we actually started the FWIN survey. So the rest of these data pri prior to 2014 are June and July. Um, they're called just AFS standard nettings. They were not done in October. So look at 2014 and I'll, I really never forget this first wind netting we did. We had this huge cohort of 24 inch walleye coming through the system. 
And that's the first time we've really had a length frequency histogram where that bell curve is kind of skewed to the right side of the, of the diagram. Um, 2016 kind of leveled out, our numbers were down again. 2017, we started to see a bump. Uh, 2018, a pretty good crop in the kind of all over range there. Um, 2019, we spread out with a small bump. And then here we are at 2020, where we start to really see the bump come up in those small walleye. So I just kind of want to show you guys how it, it changes across time. Um, we know that, but this is kind of a visual of how it has changed across time. So here's kind of some more just walleye size ranges. So in our sample, we sampled fish from 4.3 to 30 inches in total length. Our average size right now is 14.4 inches. Our walleye weights, they range from 0.3 pounds to 10.4 pounds. So our average weight is 1.5 pounds right now. And then same thing across time. So this is just 2017 through 2022. The blue bars are average total length and the orange bars are average total weight across time. So you can see we started a little bit higher, we've dipped, we've dipped, and this year we actually came up a bit. And then this is a measure of condition. So this W sub R is called relative weights. This is what we use to track condition of walleye or any fish. There's relative weights for, for many different species. Um, this is specific to walleye and this is across time as well. So it goes from 20, uh, or 2009 all the way to 2022. But again, notice some of our samples are done at different times of the year. So I would say let's focus on the October samples when we're looking at this diagram. I'm gonna move this over so I can explain it all to you. Um, on the left side, we have the, the, the size, so stock, quality, preferred, and memorable. And this is inches on the, on the describing. So 9.8 inches is about a stock size walleye. Um, across time are relative weights. Now, when we are talking relative weights, we're talking about a percentage of 100. So we wanna see around 100. That's like pretty top notch. Anything over 100 is really, really healthy. And then anything I would say below 80 is starting to cause concern for us. So look at the stock quality fish. Um, 2013, we had an 83 and 85. 2019, we had 93, 2020, 89, and this year for our stock fish, we're at 83 for a condition. Um, moved down to quality. We've kind of jumped around again with this one at different times of the year, but in the 80s, in 2013, 2014, um, we bumped up 28, uh, let's see, 2019, 91, and 92, and now we're back down a little bit, 89. Preferred, um, we were in the 90s in the 2013, 2014, and then we're in the lower 90s, 80s, and now we've kind of jumped up in that size class um, just by one percentage point, so not much. But And then memorable, uh, we don't really sample a ton of fish in this category, but back in 2013 and 2014, we had above 100 relative weight. So those fish were really healthy, and there was a, apparently a really abundant forage base at that time. 2019, we're at 87. 2020, in that size class, we were actually at 97. And this year, we're at 84. So overall, we've seen a decrease in our condition um, of walleye in starvation. And that's something that's a little bit concerning to us, considering the amount of forage work we've tried to do there. So. Okay, here we're gonna jump into the survey results that you guys provided. I think about every survey, every question was a, a little bit different, but I think we had about 57 survey response. So that was really good. And I appreciate you guys taking the time to do that and passing this on. So this was our willingness to harvest question. So this was a total number per trip. So the highest was, with the 20 plus category for walleye. There was 32%, um, as many as allowed 28%. And we jump over here, 15, uh, 
we had 12 percent uh 10 we had 18 percent and then that kind of outlier group so less than 10 we had eight percent and more than 30 we had two percent here was question two what is the smallest walleye that you would consider harvesting at starvation reservoir pretty good group of people said that they would harvest a 10 inch fish um, and then the rest were basically a 12 inch fish which that's totally understandable because it's pretty hard to get a fillet off of the 10 inch fish you can do it but um, that's the majority of respondents between 10 and a 12 inch fish what's the largest walleye that you would harvest at starvation pretty good group um, between the 18 and 20 inch range and then obviously less as we get bigger um, kind of weird that we did see a bump at 30 but I think most of the respondents were like if it's a trophy size that I've never caught before they might consider harvesting it for mounting purposes um, and then quite a few I guess between 16 and 17 but the majority said that 20 inch fish was about the largest fish that they would harvest out of starvation. This was the question asking, has walleye fishing changed for you at starvation over the years? So 54, pretty much 55% said that it has basically stayed the same. 25.5% said it has become easier. And 19, almost 20% indicated that it had become more difficult from, for them to catch walleye at starvation. Annual trips to starvation to target walleye. We have a big group in the zero to five range, which is understandable. It's kind of a far drive for everyone. And I think distance plays a huge role in how, how many times you frequent a fishery. Um, five to 10 trips a year, 21%. 10 trips a year, um, almost 6%. And then 20 plus trips a year. There's some really dedicated anglers out there. That's 13.5% 13, 13 of our respondents. And then this question was kind of trying to gauge how many actual walleye do people harvest in a year's time? So we had a, a big group say they harvest between 10 and 20 fish per year. Second was 20 to 40 fish per year. And then there was a, a few people, about seven actually, that said they harvest over a hundred walleye a year. So. Those are the results of the, the survey that you guys helped um, provide answers to, and I really appreciate that. So basically we're to this next step. What do we do after this? So right now we've actually just finished cutting all the walleye dorsal spines that we use for aging. Um, They're photographed and we'll work on aging those fish in the next week or two. Uh, usually that takes me a month, but I have a really good technician who can cut and photograph those things fast and she was done in about two days. So that's great and that'll allow us to come to our next bullet point, which is you have to plug in all this age data into our relative growth index. And this allows us to see if we still have a stunting effect going on in those age three walleye, or have we passed that? Have we thinned that population enough or decreased that population enough to where they're actually growing again? So that'll allow us to see that. And then I've got a good start to a PowerPoint. So thanks Mike for letting me uh, get this one started. But our management team consists of about, I think 15 to 20 different people, um, anglers to uh, different government organizations. They all chime in on our management plan. And we work with that team each, win each winter to work on uh, recommendations for how to move forward with this fishery. And they're not just walleye anglers, they're basically, they represent pretty much every species that people fish for in that reservoir. So it's quite challenging, but it's been really good. And they provided some good recommendations and we've tried lots of different things. So that's basically what I have for, um, for like the update for what happened at the Flynn netting this year. Um, if you guys do uh, want to ask questions now, I guess that's okay, because I'm going to move into our habitat project stuff. So I don't know, Mike, what do you want me to do? Questions now on that part or move straight to habitat? 
Does anybody have questions for Natalie? I can ask her up here so she can hear if you want. Natalie, uh, are you having any luck with planning while I up there from A taken in Willard? So we able to hear that. Yeah, I think the question was, are we having any success with planting walleye at starvation? Is that what the what the question was? Yes. Yes. But we do not stock walleye at starvation. We are actually not allowed to stock diploid walleye at starvation because they have a direct connection with the Colorado River uh, system, which is critical habitat for endangered fish. So we do not stock walleye at starvation. But with that being said, we have an overabundance of walleye in the system for the forage that we actually have. So they do plenty well by themselves and we do not see age missing age classes in our walleye at starvation. Um, I've not seen a year class failure yet. So they are very successful at spawning in starvation and likely um, up the, a little bit of the Strawberry River. Anybody else have a question? Did the fire at, at, up on the upper part of the river, Strawberry River, affect the spawning at all? We can't really prove or disprove that it affects the spawning. Um, what I've learned with the walleye population at starvation is there's like many families. They spawn in different locations, probably like eight to 10 different locations all over the reservoir. So yes, there was probably a little bit effect of the group that spawns in the Strawberry River arm, but there are so many other places that they spawn in the reservoir. Uh, it didn't seem to cause a year class failure. And if you guys think of other questions at the end too, we'll do that. We'll do some more in, at the end as well. Okay, go ahead and we'll we'll save other questions towards the end if there are any. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about habitat enhancement project. So as many of you know, the whole entire state of Utah and the whole West really deals with challenges with our reservoirs. So one of the biggest challenges is water level fluctuations. Uh, these large fluctuations cause a loss of complex habitat along the shorelines. And with the extreme drought that we've been having, they even cause more loss of habitat as we're seeing water levels in places like starvation go lower than they typically would. And this is because of irrigation drawdowns and we just don't have good inflow coming in. So this also affects our forage sustainability. You have to have some kind of habitat for our young of your fish and our age one to be able to hide in to escape these toothy predators. So one thing that we've been kicking around for several years now is artificial habitat. So there's many companies out there that create artificial habitat. And one of the things that we've, we've actually purchased are these honey hole nursery and honey hole mega nursery structures. And this is kind of what you see off to the right of this slide. So there's habitat inside, but they're protected from predators. This allows fish to come in, small fish to come in and out, but predators um, to not be able to get in there. So you can imagine the scale of these structures, the, the magnitude of how many you would have to put in to have a population level impact. And that's with all structures in our reservoirs. There's just, especially starvation, you know, it's a pretty big reservoir, 3,000 something surface acres. Um, habitat is difficult. Um, it's difficult to get started. We have many rules and regulations we have to follow. We have to work through the BOR, um, the Water Conservancy District and the state parks. Everyone has to approve of what we're doing. And then we have to have a, a certain MOU signed and a plan to even move forward with a habitat project. We have been preliminary approved to try these. We have purchased these and we need to put them together. But uh, we're thinking about next spring and these would be structures that would go kind of in 
back bays where uh, perch would spawn where there is some habitat, but they kind of lose habitat as the reservoir uh, levels recede. So this is tricky. It's going to take some moving these around. It's going to take some experimenting. And honestly, I don't know how well they'll work. So we're going to start small with these, but we have some. So the next idea that we have is utilizing these slow no-wake buoy systems with the chains and the anchors. So these can provide a kind of vertical habitat that we don't really have anywhere in the system. So we have what are called dock droppers. Um, they're some of the same material as you see inside the, the mega nursery structures, but you actually would clip these to the chain and you'd start in like 60 or 70 feet of water and you'd work all the way up. So you have something that's in that water column where you have small fish that can use it and it doesn't really move. Um, the big thing with this is, does it cause any inconvenience to the state parks managers? Because they're the ones who are moving these buoys around. And if you think about starvation, we'd really have that line of no wake buoys that goes across the um, launch ramp all the way down the beach and around the corner. And really that's the only place we have these deep buoys. The rest of the buoys there are um, hazard buoys and they're placed on structure and that usually the chain's only 10 to 20 feet deep and they end up sitting on, on land by the time we get to August. So I don't know that has a ton of potential, but it could work. It could give us something as far as forage that's in the system the entire time and available for all different sizes of fish to use. So I did talk with Dylan today at um, Starvation and he's willing to work with us and try this and see if we can add the structures. They pulled all those buoys out so we just have a big long chain to work with this winter. So I think that we'll we'll try a test one, put it in next spring and see how it looks and see how it functions for them. And then aquatic vegetation. So I went to a reservoir fish habitat partnership meeting. It's a national meeting. I, it was at Lake Shelbyville in Illinois. And I went to that in early October. Um, there's reservoir managers from all over the country there. And this is one thing that other states do that we have not even begun to look at. Um, and this is aquatic vegetation for fish habitat. Texas does this, um, Arkansas does this, and this is gonna lead me to our next habitat project that I learned about from the Arkansas Game and Fish guys that I met there in Lake Shelbyville. So. I kind of don't want to give you a quiz, but I kind of do. So all these plants down below are important. This one on the left is coontail. Um, we used to have an abundance of this at Pelican Lake. Uh, it has since been replaced by Eurasian and Northern water milfoil and chara. But it's an important plant to places like starvation. It's been there in the past, we've documented it, but we don't have a whole lot there anymore. The middle photo is called Elodia. That is another important plant. And I have proof that we have that at starvation. And where we had that, I caught more perch in a net in our forage nettings than any place on the entire reservoir. So that is important forage fish habitat. And then the plant on the right is called smartweed. And then it's kind of a floating leaf plant, but we also have seen that before. We just don't have good quantities of it there. So. We're going to try some things over the next few years. And the first thing is this Arkansas floating cube. And I'm going to show you a video in just a second on what that is and how it works. Um, we've talked about doing some willow transplants. Uh, I think it's a viable option um, in the back. And we're mostly thinking about the backs of these bays. So the back of Rabbit Gulch, um, the bay on the right side of the bridge before you go into Strawberry Arm. All those small bays on the southern side of Indian Bay. Um, and even some of those areas up in the very back of Saluratus Wash. So those are the places we're talking about. We're not talking about mid-channel, mid-lake. It just, it won't work there. And we have to start in these small back bays. And then the last thing we're kind of discussing is 
Aquatic plants are hard. I can't even find seed for these things right now. But places like Arkansas, Texas, they do have some seed propagation and they grow these in greenhouses. So we just need to reach out and do some more research and see if we can find a source. But this picture right here, this is an Arkansas floating cube. And basically what this does, it floats on the surface, it's anchored at the bottom, but you basically stock this thing full of the aquatic plant that you want to try to propagate. So in this instance, we would stock this with a coontail or a lodia. Plants like those two fragment and they release particles, they release seed, and they are able to start what are called founder colonies. These little structures can protect them from carp, they can protect them from fish, um, getting in there and rooting anything up. But I kind of want to show you this video. So let me see if it comes up here. And hopefully you can hear it too. So well, that's pretty much, oh, I need to get that going. Okay, you can see my screen again? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so that's basically what I wanted to show you. There's another few minutes on that video. They get, they have some really cool technology that they use, their universities have some underwater, um, like flying drone things that they use to take pictures, pretty cool. but. That's the gist of what we are going to attempt to do here. And now this is where I want to see if you guys have time to help. So like Badger said, we have a pretty good chunk of funding from the Starvation Walleye Classic last year that we have already set up in an account. I need help building these things in some way, shape, or form. I can coordinate supplies and obtaining them. But what I need you guys to contemplate is, do you have time this winter to help us begin to build some of these structures? Um, we would use reservoir plants, in reservoir plants, fill each structure. And 
If we can't find them in the lake, we'd find an AIS free source nearby. Uh, deployment would likely be June or July and removal in September. These are kind of temporary structures. They're not gonna be able to be in through ice sheets in the winter. And we'd likely need to move them out a little bit as water levels drop, but we're gonna start small and think big. So as you guys proceed with your meeting tonight, there's plenty of time to build these. It seems like winter would be a good time to get started. Um, and I've got some ideas. Maybe I can have one of my people build an initial first round supply list and then pass that over. But I'd kind of like to see what you guys think about it and see if that's something you'd be willing to help with. And I think that is my, yeah, that is my last slide. So, I will take any further questions and if you guys want to discuss anything else with that while I'm still here, I'd be glad to do it. Does anybody have a question for Natalie? Uh, where would, where do they want them built? So, so if we're, uh, one of the questions is where, where do you want them built? Like where would we, where are you planning on building them? We can build them anywhere. I don't know if you guys, besides the Shields building, have a central location. Most of you guys are from the Wasatch Front area. There's really no one that I know of that's in the Vernal area that could build these. So it could be as, as simple as you know finding someone who has a garage or a shop and creating kind of an assembly line and build, I'm thinking 10 to 20 of these things throughout the winter. Um, We've done some dedicated hunter projects out in our region where we work out at the game farm and build all these things, but it seems more difficult for me to have you guys try to travel out here than it is for me to help you guys get the supplies and build them out there than I come get them or we deliver them to starvation. So that's my thought process, but I'm absolutely flexible. What do you guys think about that? You think that's something that we could do as a club is sure. build some of these for now? Sure. Yeah, I think it'd be a fun project. I think we get to know each other a little bit more. Sometimes we only get to, if we do go on a boat with each other, we only go out on like, with like a couple people. But if we all get together and we start building these and she's going to get us a supply list and stuff like that, then we can figure out how to get them back up there on a trailer or something like that after we build them. Where are you going to build them? How about in here? Uh, we, we could talk to Shields, but I think probably what we'd want is like a, if someone's got an outbuilding or a, or a large garage or something like that, I think we could do it in a couple weekends. They were pretty big. The the structures were pretty yeah. big, so we need a decent sized area. But it lo also looks like we might be able to. They look like they're mostly PVC. So. Yeah, they're mostly PVC and snow fence, and the biggest ones that you guys saw out there, I think we're not going to build those ones just quite yet. We're going to start with the ones that are like three feet by three feet or four feet by four feet. That's much more manageable for us to deploy. We don't have very big boats in the region anyways. So I'm thinking we could only fit two, maybe three structures on the boat with anchor systems at a time anyways. But there's a chance too we could, so what they do, we actually did a build day at Lake Shelbyville. They build tons of habitat structures there. Lake Shelbyville itself has 1400 artificial habitat structures in the lake that the community has helped build and they have these build days, which are pretty cool. They do lunch during the middle of them, but they have a really slick assembly line process. It'd take us a minute to get to that point, but I could envision us planning a build day where we have the club members come out, build for you know three or four hours, have lunch, and then uh, pick another day if we still need to build more. But I think it could be a, a fun opportunity and maybe the start of something different i don't know yeah definitely i think i think it would be a great idea with the with the plants uh, so it sounds like we'd probably have to germinate the plants do do you have a location where they're going to be you're going to be able to like grow the plants for the structures so the first idea i have for doing this is we have bays in starvation that have some of these plants already there. The first attempts would be taking some of those plants right from those bays in the lake itself. Um, some other sources we do have um, of elodia around the region that I've kind of been tracking down. It would be 
basically going to a reservoir and cultivating those, inspecting them, making sure there was no AIS in with them, and then transplanting them over to the structures, which really it's not that difficult. I, I did some pilot projects with Elodia this summer where I basically took some straight from uh, the sediment in Red Fleet and I grew them for several weeks at the game farm property in just a small container of water. They stayed alive um, for that period of time and it wasn't extremely difficult. It's just the state of Utah doesn't really have a protocol established yet for moving plants. We transfer fish and we do things all the time with fish, but plants is a different ball game and we're going to have to kind of establish a protocol. But right now I have no seed and I don't have any greenhouses that can cultivate aquatic vegetation. So that's something I would be looking for. If you guys happen to run across a facility like that that can grow um, aquatic plants, please send me a contact. Um, there's one super small facility out here in uh, Jensen, Utah that has some aquaponics, but it's really, really small. So that's about all I have to go with on that that part of it. Okay, so you're you're still looking for for a place where you can cultivate some of that too. And if you could, I think if you could get us some more information like a, the supply list for the items and then also, even some some of the resources you're looking for as far as um like the where where you want to grow and stuff like that we could try to help find some of that as a club and kind of branch out and see if we have resources that do that because i know there's some guys who aren't as active in the club that are very adamant about uh like like ben and greg and a lot of those guys that do the the tournament fishing and stuff and i i think they'd be interested in trying to help with that kind of stuff too so we, we have some resources we could branch out and help cool. but yeah i think it's definitely something i i think would be really fun as a club and then in july or whatever when it's time to go actually deploy those we could we could even help do that too possibly and make that a that'd be a fun club outing to get together maybe have lunch together and then get, help, help natalie place those if, the, if that's something she needs help with too yeah absolutely yeah. is there a plan of the structure like the drawing yeah. yeah. Do you have do you have specs of the structure that you could get to us so we just kind of get an idea? So I asked Arkansas Game and Fish um, if they have a plan set and kind of a supplies list, and Sean has not gotten back to me yet. So I'll give him another week to get back with me, and if not, I'm just gonna start building one and make a plan set and make a supply list because gotcha. right now I don't have one in my possession. Okay. And we could even possibly help. If she has to come up with it on her own, we could even help possibly with that too. They don't look complicated. Yeah, they don't look too complicated. Probably no, I, I don't think but they're complicated. They say every time before I take 10 trips to Home Depot, so. <laughs> <laughs> like plumbing. Yeah, exactly. Adley, uh, have we benefited anybody anyway from that work that Chris Penny did in uh improving the habitat for perch at Rockport and Echo. So unfortunately I am not the expert on the northern region fisheries. I'm I'm pretty specific to what I am able to work on here in our region. Um, Chris has a research project coming up though in his region where they're gonna be looking at the deep water habitat structures. And they're gonna have a dedicated um, grad student looking specifically at those structures and the use of them by young of your perch in that anoxic or low dissolved oxygen layer of the reservoir. So I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Um, obviously Chris would, but I am so specific to working out here in the Northeastern region. I am not up to speed on their projects. Well, it appears to me that Chris has been pretty successful in growing bigger perch, a core perch, and it, it might be well to coordinate with him and see what he's done. Absolutely. Sorry, go ahead. 
I was just going to say we we have tried some deep water structure in uh, Red Fleet, and we have it in our ideas book for starvation. Um, but I definitely like to see more results from their study before we start throwing hundreds of artificial fish habitat structures in the bottom of starvation that we may never be able to get out. So I'd like to definitely see more results from them. And Natalie, weren't you also saying that you're starting to get some pushback from putting the plastic structures in too? There's some concern about that? We have started to to get a little pushback. The, the microplastic thing kind of started that whole pushback in the BOR. They don't see issues with it, but there's also, I've not been able to find an actual research paper that's published out there that shows you know, long-term effects or long-term uh, breakdown of these artificial PVC structures. So they say they're gonna last 30 years, but there's no baseline research that I can find out there. But yes, we are starting to get a little bit of pushback from deploying plastic structures in reservoirs. Yeah, permanent. So the, the nice thing is these are, these are easier to get through, it sounds like the, the plant-based ones and stuff that are temporary that we pull out every year too. And, and honestly, if, we, if these work and we can establish more vegetation, this will have a bigger population level impact than any amount of structures that I can throw in a reservoir. If we can get these going in every back bay of starvation reservoir, and then continue and try to establish some of these other plant species back into pelican or red fleet. I think we have a better chance of really having a population level impact as opposed to just having these fish attractors in some of our reservoirs because they end up being fish attractors um, in a lot of cases, but to have a real population level impact, there's a lot of structures that have to be placed in a reservoir. And it's difficult. Anybody else have a question? What about planting uh, forage fish like a shiner or shad? Is there any opportunity for that? So I have to refer back to this reservoir ultimately connects to critical habitat for endangered fish in our region and the southeast region. Are, we deal with this a lot. Every reservoir basically has some connection to the Colorado River system. Um, they have this whitelist that we can stock fish from. There are not a lot of true forage fish options on that whitelist that aren't also a sport fish. So the one thing we've been discussing in depth, and I just talked with Craig Walker again about it two days ago, is using native suckers basically as an additional forage base and even Utah chub again. So it is on the radar and he's actually got a research project slated with USU to try to, to further investigate a slew of forage species in systems like this where we are limited by repro recovery program operations to what we can and cannot stop. Um, I can say it's extremely frustrating at times. I understand both sides of the spectrum, but it is extremely frustrating to not be able to stock a true forage fish into starvation reservoir. Um, but Craig is open to it, to investigating the use of Utah chub, um, round tail chub, mountain sucker. We already have a good base of flannel mouth sucker in there and we do find those in diet contents. So that pretty much is our option. We we can stock a fathead minnow, but from everything we've seen, fathead minnows basically disappear in about a year. Um, let's see, what are the, some of the others? We really don't have any other, we cannot stock a gizzard shad. We can't stock a golden shiner. We don't have a ton of options. So. This is kind of the cards that were dealt in this fishery. Sounds tough. <laughs> it's difficult. And 
I'd say our region is subject to more of this, these restrictions than others. I mean, Utah Lake and the June Sucker Program have some of the same restrictions, uh, but there's some definite sideboards that we cannot budge. And it's unfortunate, but like I said, these are the cards that were dealt in this type of fisheries management in our region. And we do the best we can, but we are looking to other forage options as I just mentioned. Any other questions for Natalie? Okay, well, thank you, Natalie. We really appreciate you uh, meeting with us. And and it sounds definitely like something that we're interested in. So I'll work with you and we'll see if we can get something coordinated with with getting those built and maybe set up a, like a, a club event or something like that that we can maybe do some of that stuff with. Cool. Well, thanks, everyone. I appreciate the time. And if you guys have additional questions, um, all my information is up on the screen. Feel free to contact me. And uh, hopefully we'll see you guys soon and see you out fishing. Okay. Thanks, Natalie. Have You're a good night. Welcome. You too.